2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 14. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Saviour through your apostles, knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed, uh, existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found in him without spot or blemish and at peace. Great, Angeline. Thank you very much for reading that um, passage to us. Let me pray for us as we reflect on it together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and thank you for this letter of Peter, which he has written as a reminder to us to stimulate us to wholesome thinking, that we might live for you. And so I pray, Lord, that as we reflect a little bit on, on looking forward to getting ready for this wonderful future that you have prepared for us, um, please help us, Lord, to listen to you. Please, Lord, move us by your spirit uh, to live in line with your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, beside me on the wall is my year planner, and it, on it, it's got all my important dates, um, particularly for my work, but also holidays, you know, student weekend away, and of course, the Impact Conference. And I also have those dates on my phone. Maybe that's how you organize your life as well. Um, and you, you, you put various dates there, perhaps the beginning of the academic year, or your flights to and from uh, Malaysia, um, perhaps birthdays, um, other significant dates. And once they're in the diary, then we can get ready for them. You can work hard on those assignments. You can book those flights. You can buy that present. And I particularly like my year calendar on the, on the wall because it reminds me of what's coming up. Because we know what we're like. It's easy to forget, and we need parents, our college, or our phone to remind us to get ready for what's ahead. If God had a diary, the next significant date in it would be the return of Jesus Christ to this world. What Peter in this chapter calls the day of the Lord, a day of cosmic significance, a day of judgment when our present home will be destroyed, and a day of salvation, when God will reveal a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness, an extraordinary day. It's in God's diary, but it's not in ours. He can put a date to it, but we can't. And that's what makes it difficult to get ready for. 
it's easy to forget about it and to just live for ourselves for today. And even when we do think about it, does it really shape our plans and decisions? It's a real challenge to get ready for Jesus' return and our new home. And yet it is possible. And the Apostle Peter wants us to be ready. And so he's given us three reminders to help us. And the first is, keep trusting in God's word. And that's vital because it reminds us there will be a new hope. Peter has written these words because he wants his readers to remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the, of the Lord and Saviour through your apostles. And in particular, the commandment about the day of the Lord. Because others people are speaking about it this day. Scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. It seems God's all talk and no action. History just keeps on going. It's the same old, same old. Will God come? Can God come? And we hear variations of this question today in some of our cultures. Our world began by accident. It's the result of matter plus time plus chance. And so it's going nowhere. There's no destination that our world is heading towards. There's certainly no future judgment, no new home. And so history has no meaning. It's like noodles, all mixed together in the bowl, going in different directions, but nowhere in particular. Now we try to give our lives meaning. We give ourselves a morality to live by, but at the end of the day, it's up to us. There's no God telling us how to live or holding us accountable for how we live or preparing a home for us to live in one day. And that view is the assumption that many people in our world live with today. It's in the media, in our studies, among our friends. And to be honest, it doesn't seem plausible to believe anything else. Intelligent people don't, progressive people don't, influential people don't. Believing that Jesus will return isn't just mad, but it's dangerous to your mental health and others. And so with all those words around us, Peter wants us to tune into God's word and to keep trusting it. Verse 5. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. There is an end to our world because there was a beginning. There's a personal God who spoke and brought this world into existence. And it was a very good world made by him and for him, and he made human beings in his image to know and love and live for him together. He gives us real purpose and meaning and significance. And if he can make the world, then he can judge it and remake it. Verse seven, by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. God's word is powerful. It creates and it keeps. Our stable world with the earth going round the sun and the planets in their places and the seasons and the day and night. This is all evidence of God keeping his world, not his absence from it. And God's word will judge our world. And God's done that before. Peter in verse 6 mentions Noah's flood. When God kept his word and judged his world, people scoffed at that idea then. Like, a flood? Really? That's never happened before. Is that really possible? But it was. And God will do the same again. By the same word. Not with water, 
but with fire. And so as we go about life in the UK or Malaysia, in our studies and work with family and friends, in order for us to be ready for our new home, we must keep trusting God's word about that home. We live in cultures that scoff at that idea, but Peter is calling us to have confidence in God's word. God will do what he's promised. You can take his word for it. After judgment, there will be a new home. And then secondly, take advantage of God's patience. And that's vital because God wants people to enjoy his new home with him. Since Easter, back in April, uh, we've been to a number of weddings. In fact, back in April, we had a family wedding when my wife's brother was married. A really enjoyable day with people zooming in to be with the happy couple. And we've had several weddings since then of members of our church family here in Oxford. Now, if you've been to a wedding, you'll know that there's usually a lot of waiting. In the UK, it's usually for the bride. Our current record for our wedding is a bride who was over two hours late. Even the groom was worried. But that's nothing compared to Jesus coming. Like, where is he? Why is he taking so long? And Peter reminds us, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God has a different perspective on time. He's outside time, but we're inside it. First see it. With the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Fast and slow are relative perspectives on time. Now, you see this with children. A few weeks ago, I drove my family off on a week of holiday to a house where we were staying for that week. And as we set off, my daughter said to me, how long will it take us? And I said, four hours. What? Four hours? That's such a long time. Well, it is to her, but it's not to me. And certainly not compared to a flight to Malaysia from the UK. And Peter reminds us, God isn't slow. Don't be frustrated at his delay. Instead, he's patient. God cares about his world. He cares deeply about justice, about how we have lived in his world and treated him and treated each other and our world. And that's where this imagery of fire comes in, in verse 10. It's a frightening picture of God's judgment. He will destroy this sinful world. Everything will be laid bare. Sin and evil were not a part of the world that God made, and he will punish them and remove them completely. And God cares deeply about salvation. And so that's why beyond the judgment, there will be a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Now, for many of us, home isn't simply an address, a street name or a house or apartment number, but home is the people. And God wants his home to be full of his people, righteous people. So how do we get there? Well, it's not by tidying up our lives. It's not like that student who tidies up their college room and you walk in and the floor's clear and the bed's made and the shelves are neat. But you open the wardrobe and the clothes fall out because they've just been shoved in out of sight. We can't tidy up our lives before God, giving the impression we're fine. God sees it all. It's all laid bare before him. He knows our secrets, even if others don't. And it's not by being good enough. You can't pass God's judgment by having an excellent moral record with your own righteousness. It isn't like school or university 
where many of us are striving to be good enough to pass the course, to make the grade, to win the prize. God's home will be full of righteous people, not because of us, but because of Jesus. Jesus will come again because he came the first time. He stepped into history and he lived the righteous life we should have lived. And he died the death we should have died. And on the cross, Jesus took God's punishment for all our sins and was raised to new life. And so he offers to us, let me take your sin, your unrighteousness, and let me give you my righteousness so that on the day of the Lord, you can enter into the home of righteousness. When do we take advantage of this offer? We repent. We admit our sin to God. We come clean with him. No secrets. We admit all our attempts to tidy up our lives or to be good enough are not good enough. And we turn 180 degrees from our sin and to our saviour, Jesus Christ. And trusting in him, we receive his righteousness. Not everyone can sort out their lives, but anyone can repent. And Jesus hasn't returned yet because God's patient. He wants you in his home. So repent. Live a life of repentance, turning from sin and turning to Jesus. And as Christians, we thank God for his patience and for enabling us to repent. But this isn't just good news for a few people. It's good news for everyone. For that person down your corridor, for those people on your sports team or music group, for those friends on social media. Who could you share this good news with? Why not pray for someone who you could speak to and take the opportunity to speak of God's patience and love and new home. And then finally, look forward to God's day. And that's vital so that we get ready for our new home. What are you looking forward to? At the moment, I'm looking forward to my holidays, which begin on Monday. <clears throat> And we're going to the east part of England and we're looking forward to exploring the countryside and eating good food and reading our books and spending time together as a family. Are you looking forward to God's day, to Jesus' return? Maybe after months of suffering caused by COVID and the struggles in our lives and after seeing and experience the injustice in our world, we might say, yes, Yes, I am looking forward to his coming. I want to live in a world that's better than this one. And Peter three times tells us to look forward to God's day. Our present world will end with an encounter with the living God. And he will judge our world and usher in our new world. A number of years ago, a director was producing a play on Broadway in New York, and the rehearsals were going badly. Something wasn't right. And eventually the director realized that the actress playing the lead role wasn't good enough. She couldn't handle the part. And so in the end, he decided to swap the supporting actress and the lead actress. And that changed everything. The lead actress fitted the role perfectly. She performed the part as if she'd been made for it. And the actress who had been the lead did a great job in the supporting role. The rehearsals went well and the play was a great success. And in a sense, that's the story of our world. Our world will never be right. We'll never be right if we live life as if we're the lead actor or actress, as if the script is all about us when it's not. God's directing the play, his world is the stage, and we're the supporting cast with Jesus Christ as the lead actor. The spotlight is on him. And once we grasp that, 
then we can repent of trying to play the leading role and instead live out the supporting role we were made for. And Peter says, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? We're to be holy, set apart from him. We're to be godly, being like him, pleasing him in every area of our lives. Verse 14, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish. Just as a water filter purifies your water so it's clean and healthy. So we are to make every effort to filter out sin, those thoughts that pollute our minds, those words that spoil our relationships, those actions that muck up our lives. And we live at peace with God in a right relationship with him, restored because of Jesus. Not everything will burn up on Judgment Day. What's righteous will enter into our new home. And so we're to live life now in anticipation of that day and in preparation of it. And that's a challenge, not only because we're me focused, trying to play the lead role, but we're now focused, living for the present. But Peter wants to expand our horizons, to see God's horizons, for us to look forward to God's day. So that we look beyond our degree our career, or that relationship, or our social media profile. And looking forward to that day will help us not to be too casual or flippant or forgetful about the things that really matter, like holiness and godliness and repentance. And so allow God's future to shape how we study and where we study and whom we marry and the other big and small decisions of life. And if we live like that, Looking forward, Peter says something extraordinary. We actually speed Jesus' return. Yes, God has set a date, but from where we're standing, this day is coming quicker because we're longing for it and living for it. We could be home sooner than we think. And if that's the case, then be ready for our new home. Keep trusting in God's word. Take advantage of God's patience and look forward to God's day.